Hello and welcome to Property Summits, essential viewing for landlords, investors and developers alike. I'm Emma Birchley and joining me today are five experts with bags of experience in the property world. Together they represent a property portfolio worth a whopping £1.5 billion. Now, Tony Gimple knows all there is to know about the private rental sector and is leading advisor when it comes to tax planning. John Howard also knows a thing or two about property, having bought and sold more than 3,500 houses, apartments and developments in the UK. I'm joined too by Nicholas Woolwork, another seasoned property developer and investor who is CEO of the world's largest international property forum. Finally with me here in the studio is Richard Bush, founder of Crowd Lords which offers crowdfunding property investments across the UK. And of course, we mustn't forget property entrepreneur Paul Mahoney, joining us all the way from Australia, founder of Nova Financial Group, which provides property investment advice with a particular focus on buy to let. Well, today we're talking about permitted development. Now, this is something I don't know a lot about, but it's your bag, I understand, Nicholas. Just a little bit, yeah. And um, I guess for the viewers, permitted development, PD, if we refer to it going forward, is um, everything from uh, an extension of your house right through to larger commercial developments where you can convert and recycle old commercial buildings primarily. And there's lots of different facets to it, but ultimately, in simple terms, that's what it covers. And it's a much less restrictive planning process for developers and investors alike. So it's really welcomed in the industry. And what difference does it make in terms of reusing buildings that otherwise might be going to rack and ruins? I think it, you know, it, it works twofold. A, it delivers more housing stock to the market, which is much needed. We all know we're not building enough homes in the UK. So in terms of the overall market, I think it's a real positive that there's extra stock being able to be delivered, usually by the smaller and medium-sized developers, not the major house builders. That's the, not their bag. They're building housing estates and huge amounts of homes. Um, we like to get involved in recycling buildings. You know, it's, it's also a positive eco effect, if you like, you know, whereas an office might be going to rack and ruin as an office, it can't compete with a grade A listed office um, for quality. Instead of spending hundreds of thousands of pounds getting it to that quality as an office, it can be probably more cost effectively refurbished into, uh, you know, a block of flats. And the rules have changed recently, haven't they? The rules have changed a lot. You know, last year in September, there was changes. There's more changes coming in July of this year. Um, but they're all good changes, you know, they're all positive. We've got this new Class E now, which is kind of an all-encompassing all class, which covers PD changes between, back and forward between a lot of the use classes. So what that means is the use classes are is a planning class and it defines, you know, shops um, and restaurants will all be sort of A1 and A2 retail uses. Um, you've got the C classes, which are all residential classes. Um, you've got the D classes, which is dentists and doctors and surgeries and all these kind of places. They all now have various PD rights that allow you to do a certain amount of changes to put residential in place of them and sometimes backwards and forwards. So um, it's very um, positive for the industry. It means that businesses can change use um, easier. It means we can get more residential property onto the market that might have been uh, disused offices and, and other buildings that are disused and had problems. And with the pandemic, you know, I think that's you know, going to be really valuable. They've, they've, you know, I don't know if they saw this coming. They can't have seen a pandemic coming, right? But that certainly the pandemic um, is going to create a lot of external, a lot of extra, sorry, um, commercial space that would have been going to rack and ruin with, with unfortunate, you know, businesses that have gone bust and, and, you know, had difficulty. So I'm looking forward to seeing more stock come to the market. The first few years of this PD implementation delivered a lot of stock early, but it started to dry out. And the prices, when people realised what they had as office owners, prices were going through the roof so actually the profit margins narrowed and I think we're in a position now where there's still this sort of perceived market where we're in a difficult market although the housing market has boomed I think that's not necessarily the property development market I think it's more the homeowners market has boomed and that's what house prices have shown homeowners moving and buying taking advantage of the stamp duty holidays the property developers market was difficult and has been difficult but now with the pandemic more stock coming to the market I think there's opportunity for us investors in this in this industry right now. Is that something you are Nicholas, hoping for? I never realised I was an eco warrior for the last <laughs> 35 years. I've been converting offices there to you go. residential for 35 years. I never realised <laughs> I was an eco warrior. You I'm, put that on I'm your delighted. Now, John. My stepdaughters will be yeah. even more proud of me than they already Carbon are. Hopefully, well, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Is it easier now, though? <laughs> it's it's a lot easier now. What I would say, and, and, and Nicholas is absolutely right, what he said, but a few. Just a few cautious words I'm going to give, if I may. First of all, um, there's no uh, permissive development in Wales, because I'm doing a, a conversion in Wales at the moment, so you have to go for full planning and think that's the same with Scotland. 
uh, of course, they don't vote Conservative in those two uh, countries. Why so, are you going up there, Lendron? Um, so, <laughs> <that's interesting. laughs> so, so they're not as keen to get on with all this as, as, as they should be, in my view. The other thing is, under the old permissive development, which we've got now, it's very simple to convert uh, offices to residential. There's only two things anyone can hold you up on. The council, there are only two things the council can really stop it on. One is not having enough waste bins, and the other is cycle storage, have enough cycle racks. Now, those two things seem very simple for everyone, but they're not, because if you've got no external space, where do you put the waste bins? and where do you put your cycle stores? So be careful, they're the two things that, that the council can stop you on. Under the new rules, where you can put an extra two floors on a block of flats, for instance, or a block of uh, PD scheme, block of offices, to put another two floors on, the, the rules are harder to get through. So they've got more reasons why they can turn you down, such as if the building doesn't look very nice, um, for instance, would be a, a very simple one they could stop you doing it on. So. The new rules are great and Class E is wonderful, but there are reasons and there, there are reasons to be cautious about it. That's, that's all I would really I say. To add before we move yeah. on, it's really important that those two things are really poignant, absolutely. There are more things that get considered now and the, that, that seems that the council are adding more and more things as we go. As this PD yeah. gets more implemented, more sophisticated. they're getting it. Yeah. And again, this is where I get frustrated with the, the local authorities getting their grip on the planning process. They seem to be interpreting things themselves and adding extra things in for their regions. So, which is exactly what the government don't want. Which the is what government they don't wanted want. a really yeah. simple thing, yeah. and it has been in the past up till now. But it is getting more complicated. And one last thing before, because Richard's, I know, if you're funding these deals, the one other thing is just because you can do it doesn't mean you always should. So, if you're in an area where it's it's a very commercial area. And it, and, but you can get the PD... Yeah, like an non-industrial estate yeah, or something. You know, you may decide you don't want to do it anyway because you won't get funding from someone like Richard or if he'll fund it to develop it, you won't get the building societies to lend to individual buyers at the end. True. Big risk. Yeah. What are the considerations for you then when you're looking at Well, these? I think permitted development is great because you know that you can develop it and therefore you're safe to buy it. But like John says, th there are so many things about many of these properties that don't make them ideal as residential properties. So we've seen many situations where people have purchased a, a building they think they convert into 30 flats. But when they get inside and they look at the structure and they look at various things like waste, they realise actually it's not that easy. So and fire safety is a big and one. Fire safety is a really to good example. To bring these up to spec is really yeah. tricky sometimes. So I think whilst it gives an impression that you will be able to get planning, it doesn't mean that it makes it a good development. And then the other thing that John mentioned, I think it's the most important, is a, there's a lot of um, conversions, it might be 100 units, 120 units in a, in a large office, that once they've been converted, people can't get mortgages on them because they're all bought by investors and uh, the mortgage companies don't want to be exposed to too many investors in one block. And often they're on the edge of an um, industrial estate, on the, on the edge of a, uh, an office park, and that's not necessarily where you want to buy your first flat or your second flat. So I think... Just be careful is what we're permitted saying. Permitted doesn't mean good. It just so that's, means permitted. that's interesting. So you might have a, a block that's been developed, gorgeous flats inside, but, um, and you might want number 17, but you can't get anyone to lend you the money to have it because the way it was financed was so complicated. Well, or yes, or what tends to happen is that the area, the, there tends it? to be 100 investors in that one Oh, block. I see, so it's multiples. And really. lender A was already exposed to 18 of those, so he doesn't want to expose himself any further to more units in the same block, and it can be a real problem. And therefore the value drops significantly because people can't find a mortgage, and before you know it, it's not a profitable but project. But like everything, you know, position, position, position. Yeah. If it's in a really, if it's an industrial area, then, you know, I always, I always look at this. Would I want my relative stepchildren to, to, would I buy a flat for them to live there? And if the answer is no, uh, and that's a good question to ask everyone who's investing and developing themselves, if the answer is no, why do you think someone else is going to? So I use that as a, as a, as a, you know, as a leveller, if you like, to see whether I should do a deal. And the not. value you're going to get if it's not the right location is going to be yeah. lower than if it's in yeah, absolutely. a better place yeah. near yeah. the bars or yeah. shops. I think or the rest. important point that, that's coming out there from what everyone's saying is the most important thing is the end use. You know, John took yes. the words of my mouth. Just because you can convert it doesn't mean it should be converted. And you need to determine what am I going to do with it after I've converted it? Am I going to keep it myself and rent it out? Or am I going to sell it off? 
and Richard's very right as well. I've seen it happen before where, especially if it's not in a great location and it's in, in a, you know, an ex-industrial park that's still sort of semi-converting to residential, lenders hate that sort of thing because there's no established market for rentability. So, you know, let, buy to let lenders, especially if it's investor-led, and just a little bit onto what Richard said there, some lenders are okay with developments that are fully investor-led. So they'll only lend up to a certain percentage on the site, and then they'll have to be spread across other lenders. Some are okay with that for, you know, if it's a location they're, they're comfortable, will have demand in, in, in the rental market. But the location is absolutely key. Uh, and, and I have seen a lot of them that are kind of, you know, off the fringe of a city in an area that, you know, you wouldn't have walked down in the dark very long ago. Absolutely. And that's not where you want to be doing it. And that, and that goes back to my point, well, if you don't want your, your, your family to live there, you'd be worried about your daughter living there, then you shouldn't be probably investing in it anyway. But then, John, don't you think that a lot of the towns are going to change in use because of the pandemic and how we're going to, you know, we no longer go to the shops as much and so on, and so the town will change, and that has to start somewhere. So well, until people start making yeah. use of permitted development, that, that town centre isn't well, going to revolve into what it needs Absolutely, to and the town fund, this town fund that the government have got, I think Tony, 40 odd towns across the UK, they've invested 25 million into this town. Ipswich, of course, is one of them. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, nearly every town, bar one or two, are conservative uh, seats. Isn't that funny? Isn't that strange? It's just coincidence. Um, fancy, just a coincidence. Um, but Tony, you know, you, 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 from an, a tax point and a, an investment point, you know, these towns are going to improve. They're going to um, almost become garden cities, if you like, within a city or a village, garden village within a city, I think. Oh, well, you know, it, it, it comes back to the point we talked about in, in, in the first programme, the housing shortage. And just because you have permitted development, doesn't mean to say, A, people will want to develop it. No. You know, it's still going to meet all the building regs. And more to the point, you know, if it's attracting younger families, where's the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. you know, so you've got to have you know, the doctors, the dentists, the schools. parking, the schools. Yeah. You know. So take where I live on, on, on the south coast. You know, we're, we're literally within walking distance of the South Downs National Park. And yet, there are no greenfield sites. It's entirely brownfield. And the biggest single, and, and, and you know, Seaford is not a large town by any stretch of the imagination. And yet the biggest single objections are, well, we don't have enough doctor surgeries, we don't have enough dentists, we don't have enough schools. So yes, you, you can build more under PD, but who's gonna bring in and all of course, the other support yeah, services? That makes a really good point, by the way. Under PD, under permissive development, you do not pay any social housing requirements, and you don't pay any uh, community infrastructure levy, SIL it's called. So, under the, so it really is a, a, um, a really easy way to get into property development if that's what you want to do. But it doesn't... Pro provided it, you're not adding extra space. To provided you're extra space, yes, yeah, sorry. So, so that's a really space. big plus. But of course, um, for the more socially aware of us round, round this t table, uh, 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 this area, and also Paul, who likes paying more tax than everyone else, you could argue that they ought to be a donation or a contribution to how to, to schools uh, and to the infrastructure of the town. So, the, but under under permissive, there is not. No, just quickly, they are starting to creep in these levies, shall we say? Um, I've had a site recently where they've put in a, a sang, which is a, I know it's an acronym, I apologise for that, um, but it is ultimately um, to do with the environmental areas and you need to put, you know, there's going to be more uh, people coming to the area, more people walking their dog in the local park, so you need to provide more park and open space for those people. So you have to make contributions to the council to supply this kind of social space elsewhere. It's another form of the same thing. It's paying the, paying the council's yeah. section 106, SIL, SANGS, it's creeping but in. But technically, um, there shouldn't be any with permissive development. What 
difference has it made um, that there are now these minimum space standards? Obviously, if the person that's going to end up um, uh, buying one of these properties, if you've got, uh, you know that you're going to get a certain size, I think, what is it, 37 square metres for a one bedroom flat with a shower room. Um, great for them, so good for the developers? I think the idea of bringing in the national space standard into the PD market was a, a, um, a bad idea. I think the fundamental idea they wanted to achieve was to stop the unscrupulous developers building rabbit hutches for people and, and the low end of that market. I think 37 square metres is too high. I think they should have brought in a lower standard for PD to enable the PD sites. I want to hear Richard's view on this in a moment. He disagrees with me. Excellent. Um, so I think there's a I think it's important there's a space standard for PD, absolutely, because you can't be building 10 square metre rooms and renting those out. That's appalling and that has gone on. So it needed some change. I think the minimum space standards at 37 square metres is too high. You know, something at 20, 25 square metres, well space designed in, ta in town centre locations is completely acceptable. You know, it's a, a really big, large sort of hotel Sweet and it's room. the first step on the ladder for people because you yeah, don't expect your first home necessarily to be very big, do you? No, exactly. Especially if you're in a town or a city. People in their early 20s and, and sometimes early 30s need affordable accommodation. And we're not talking council affordable location, we're talking professionals that need, and they want to own it, they don't want to rent it. You know? and, and, and what we're building primarily, as John touched upon recently, was the house builders are building... What was the percentage? The number of uh, oh, major 70, house people? 70% of houses of housing stock built in the UK are built by ten, the 10 major house builders. Right, so that's housing houses yeah. on housing estates. Yeah. Very little flats and certainly no smaller flats. So there's a huge gap in the market for a well-designed micro studio, which might be 20 to 37 square metres, that range. Mm. They've cut that off. But Emma, we don't know anyone so, who does those. No. no one at all here does those. Oh, hang on a minute. So not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> not, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. What do you no, think, Richard? So, yeah, what, do you, what do you think, Richard? I can see that there's a market for rental at that, at that level, but I just think to myself, how would I have liked to have spent the last 12 months or six months locked down on the last 12 months in a 37 square metre box? without any outdoor space, without... But that's, that's a huge apartment, it's not a box. 37 square metres is a really good sized studio one bed apartment. But it's still small. Okay, so let me, let me put this to you. Would you rather be in a six and a half square metre HMO bedroom, which is fully allowed by the regulations, or a 25 square metre fully self-contained, well-specced, well-space designed apartment of your or, own? Or? Near Reading. Or an HMO of six and a half, seven square metres, which is the minimum space standard for HMOs. But that isn't the choice. Six and a half. It isn't a case of either you're in a six metre square... It HMO. kind of is, because well, I believe there's a gap in the market in that, in that area. You're either in a shared house, which is, we know is booming in the market, because these young people need affordable accommodation so to rent I'd and live in. I'd rather be in a shared house. I'd rather be in a shared space yeah. where I've got more than... It's just personally. Yeah. Than I've, uh, you know, a small box where I, where I can reach out of my bed and turn the TV on and reach the other side and flush the loo. I need to show you one of my, my previous sites because it's not like that. They're beautiful yeah, but you apartment space And design. there are some people that are developing things that are not, they're not well, in they're not happening. I completely agree with that. I mean, it needs but, a minimum space don't, standard. But don't you yeah. think that's been done because, the, because there's such a demand for housing? You know, there's such a demand for housing. And of course, the bigger you make these units, the less units, less units you, can you deliver. have. Yeah. And the government have actually shot themselves in the foot a little bit with it. I, I tend to, uh, unfor usually, I don't tend to agree with Nicholas, but on this I think I do, where I think actually they've gone a bit over the top. That's typical politicians. They've had a load of grief, over so the they've top. gone over the top. And the truth is somewhere in between the two, probably. Um, they couldn't think for themselves. Yeah. They just went, what's the, what's the reg we well, can't regulation you've we had 11 have? Housing, oh, you've had 11 37. housing ministers in 10 years. Yeah. So yeah, that's the know. problem. That's yeah, the that is the problem. If I can just weigh in, guys, I think it's all about the use of the space. You know, I'm sure Nick's uh, small apartments are very well laid out and therefore they may feel a lot bigger than they actually are. And so sometimes a 25 square metre flat could feel a lot nicer than a 50 square metre flat, depending on how the space is laid out and the spec and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, I was asked a question last week, is it better to invest in new build flats or conversions, which, you know, quite often now are the permitted development um, uh, developments. A and the answer is it depends on what, what conversion you're talking about, because, 
you know, there are some great conversion. I, I own some converted flats and they're you know, in, in, in the Midlands and the North where, you know, they look like the building where you guys currently are now. They're really nice old brick buildings that have been converted and people like living in them. They're usually very spacious with high ceilings, all that sort of thing. And then you have, you know, 1960s, fairly ugly office blocks that are being converted to off to, to, to residential, which probably shouldn't be. And quite often with permitted development, you can't touch the outside. So it still looks like a fairly unattractive 1960s office block. Um, so, yeah, there's a big scale there, desirability-wise. And I think that's what it comes down to is, you know, the desirability to the end user. We've mainly talked, haven't we, about office blocks being converted, but, but I guess there are more options than that. Where else can you go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I touched upon earlier um, other sort of use classes that have been developed and are being opened up to PD rights. So that can be doctor surgeries, all of those yeah. kind of classes, nurseries. dentists, nurseries, nurseries. School, school nurseries. Yeah, absolutely. Shops and retail, you're allowed to build stuff above and out the back now, you know, maybe re sh shrinking the size of the retail, but having some residential mixed use scheme created. So there's lots of opportunities right now. Well, actually, it's on, it, it's on the doctors and dentist surgery type where there's going to be a huge potential. You know, there's a very much a move for end-to-end -end healthcare, almost the uh, best marigold hotel type model, where you, you've got everything on the one site. You know, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, mm -hmm. pharmacy, you know, all of the services. So literally, you can, you can have you know, proper care for an entire community. And so if, if you're looking to you know, run a business based around you know, healthcare, there are plenty of sites where you can get the tax breaks, the PD, and actually help you know, in, in the relatively short term make some of these older industrial conversions you know, far more attractive to lenders because people will want to live there. You know, it's, it, it, it all comes down to having more space, more homes where people can live, whether it's owned, shared, rented, or some other variation on that theme, we still come back to the housing shortage and the nimbyism that has pervaded society for a long time. So you have to look at the PD in the round and say, yeah, I can do it, but who's my end buyer yeah. going to I be? I mean, what I would say, Tony, like all these developments across the UK, be it conversion or new build or whatever, you know, there's good developers and there's developers that aren't so good, and there's areas that are better than others, and, and, and really you just need to try and keep the standards up, but keep things at an economic level so people can afford to buy them. And you know, house builders and developers get knocked for say, oh well, it looks a bit cheap. This that. Well, you know, it appeals to one section of the market that can't afford anymore. So that's got to be taken into account as well. What's interesting is that the, the care home market hasn't been influenced really by the PD implementations much yet. No. And there's a lot of older care homes that are going to rack and ruin in the same way that the office have and, and other commercial I'd, buildings. I've just managed to save one. So I've just bought a, house, a, a nursing home to convert in, back into houses. So it's a, Yeah, they make great conversions. So I'm doing my bit. Um, but there's, they've not had the benefits of the PD rights yet. No, so they haven't. I'd like to see that come in because mm. as leading on from Tony's point, the, the, the care home market, which is a booming market with a, an aging population, is, is in, you know, we need a lot of housing there as well. Mm. And what's being built is these ready-made, beautifully new, designed, yeah. brand new care homes, which is great for that market, but it leaves the older ones but also floundering. But great opportunity for developers. Yeah. Great opportunity. Well, thank you all very much. We are out of time. I've learned an enormous amount about permitted de development that I never knew I needed to know. I feel much better informed great. now. <laughs> so thank you ever so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for for now. Until next time, bye-bye.